Greetings from Krabi, Thailand. Check this out. This is the C500 Mark II. Over the last two weeks I've been here in Thailand, I've been taking this thing with me everywhere. One of the first things that I really noticed is just like the build quality of these cameras. Now, it's not metal, it's plastic, which is nice because it's lightweight, but these can actually go through a lot of abuse. I've seen C300s and C200s used on so many documentaries where they get really put through their paces, going through harsh terrain and rough environments. Here, let me show you something. I can actually submerge this in the water for a split second and watch this here. <laughs> oh my God, that gave me a heart attack just doing that bit. I made sure everything on the camera was super tight before I recorded that. No, not even I would do that. That would 100% ruin the camera. Why am I filming this at the edge of this pool? This is a bad idea. <laughs> Let's move somewhere else before something bad happens. Here we go. I think this is a little bit safer for a review, huh? Oh my God, I'm flexing so hard right now. I'm just like, yeah, look at our mansion that we're staying in. This whole place, it's nuts. And it was like 399 bucks a night or something like that. 399 divided by five people, that would be like 80 bucks per person. That yeah. Now there were a couple of things that made the C300 Mark II really compelling documentary camera. First of all, again, it could take a beating. Can't throw it in the pool, but you still take a beating. It's pretty lightweight. Surprisingly, a lot of people are actually surprised when they pick it up, they go, that's oh, actually not so bad. I actually vlogged with it for a big chunk of this trip. Man, the cloud just totally covered me, which is actually not bad, because now we're getting much more even lighting. And that's one of the things that you face when you're shooting on something like a mirrorless camera right you need even lighting you don't have that much dynamic range but that's some of the beauty of shooting on a camera like this is that you can just be in harsh shadow and the background could be bright and it actually doesn't look nearly as bad and I think that's one of the things that really make these kinds of cameras appealing is that you can't always control your lighting see the Sun decided to come back out ruin my exposure but when you have so much dynamic range in a camera you don't have to control your environment nearly as much so that's one of the first questions a lot of people ask like well, what's the difference between this and shooting on something like this EOS R. And as long as you're in a well-controlled environment, you can make any camera look really good. But when you're in harsher places, like if you're a documentary filmmaker filming in South Africa, and you have no control over the lighting, you just need a camera that can capture that dynamic range. And this definitely fits the bill for that. And of course, the C500 Mark II is beautiful with its full frame sensor. That's something that everyone's been waiting for in a cinema camera for a while now. But anyways, let me show you some footage I shot here in Thailand. hiking through the jungles of Northern Thailand. My camera of choice for this hike, C500 Mark II. Am I regretting it? Kind of, it's a little bit big. But getting out to some of these kind of remote to off the grid location is a real treat. So I really want to get the best possible images while I'm up there. So I think it'll be worth it, hopefully. <laughs>
first impressions out of this was, wow, I was really impressed with the image quality coming out of this. It's much sharper, much cleaner, more dynamic range, and just overall a better image compared to something like a full frame mirrorless camera. Not 100% sure how it's gonna look after YouTube's compression and depends on what resolution you guys are watching it on. But when I'm looking at it full screen on my 4K display, I can 100% say this is just on a whole nother league. I think one of the videos I need to make is, you know, this EOS R versus the C500 Mark II, show you some side-by-side -side comparisons. And uh, I don't know, is that a video you guys wanna see? Pull right there, bang. Now pretty much all the Thailand shot, I was using autofocus with my EF lenses. And as you would expect out of Canon's dual pixel autofocus, it performed great. It was very reliable and sharp. Perfect for when you're a solo operator, just trying to get the shot, cause you're just looking off this little teeny monitor. And as long as you see that square around that subject's face, you know, oh, it's sharp on them. So that's a great feeling to have. And sure, I know manual focus is still the way to go because you have a little bit more control over how it focuses, what to rack to, it's just a lot more of an organic feel to manually focus it. But when the autofocus gets as good as this camera, I definitely consider it to be a professional level autofocus. And there's a lot of benefits to going autofocus opposed to manual, especially when you're on a full frame sensor and you got that nice, fast, shallow depth of field lens on there. I mean, it's hard to get that perfect focus. So you're just like putting most of your attention onto making sure that focus is perfectly right there. Subject moves a little bit, you're like, oh, you gotta chase it. And if all your attention is tunnel vision into making sure that focus is right, it's very easy to miss things like what's in your frame? How's your composition? What else is going on in the room? Should you be getting a shot of this instead of that or that? I just love the feeling of just going, all right, camera, focus on that person's face and I get to think about other stuff. And for the type of shooting I was doing in Thailand, it was perfect. And for a lot of it, I was using the built-in image stabilization on this camera. Now it's not like IBIS where the sensor moves or anything like that. It's digital image stabilization. And I think it's very similar to the ones you would find on a camera like this EOS R. And the way I was just kind of hand holding it, it really helps to have one little padding of stabilization. So that's when I would turn it on in here. Oh, by the way, I should mention, it does not work when you're shooting raw. But in the 10 bit codec I was using in 4K, you could turn it on and it works just fine. It does work about 98% of the time, but I don't believe it's using any any of the gyroscopic to gyrosco gyroscope. You know, like GoPros, it uses the data of the camera's motion and then uses that, pairs it against the footage and smoothens out the footage. That's a pretty good way to go. This does not do that. And I'm assuming that because if I go in onto a really tight close up and the subject is filling up most of the frame, then it tends to track with that subject a little bit. I notice it a lot when I'm filming my dog's panting because the dog's kind of moving this like kind of panting pattern and the camera kind of tracks with it, even if the camera is staying still. And also some of this footage, as he kind of nods a little bit, you can kind of see that the camera's almost tracking with him a little bit. That's that digital image stabilization, kind of analyzing that frame and kind of tracking with him. So sometimes it can throw off a shot. It can look a little bit weird, but again, 98% of the time, I'd say it looks pretty good. Just in close-ups is where I really tried to kind of avoid that. So for example, this is the 100 mil F2.8. The image stabilization on this lens is actually really solid. So if I'm getting a shot where I'm worried about that, I might slap this on turn on the image stabilization on the lens and turn it off on the camera just to avoid that from happening. Cause you know, optical image stabilization is a physical movement. It's not gonna try to analyze something or anything weird like that. So overall image stabilization, nice, but it's not perfect. I would say it's almost the exact same as something you would get out of the EOS R. By the way, funny story. We went in to go listen to that Buddhist monk talk about Buddhism and how he lives his life. And it was really eye opening. Buddhism was not what I was expecting it to be. It was really about just training your mind and body to just be happy and really just be a good person. And with that comes happiness just on the inside. And that really sounds like Buddhist stuff, right? But really it's like, you don't need external things to make yourself happy. You can just be alone, quiet, and just very content with life. So I, I can get behind that. But as we were going into the temple, I was like, oh, a Buddhist monk. And he was like, oh, I saw your YouTube channel. Wow. <laughs> Big cinematic camera from Hollywood and- Really? Wait, yes. Gerard, did you do this? No, I did not do this. 
He knows who you are. I was like, what? I didn't even know Buddhist monks watched YouTube. Turns out they stay up to speed with technology and as long as it's helpful or informative, they watch quite a bit of YouTube. He started talking about his favorite comparison videos like the Airy Alexa Cinema cameras and compare. I thought that was hilarious. So to all the Buddhist monks that are subscribed, sorry to up. Pretty sure that's what I'm supposed to say. I was in Thailand for two and a half weeks. I should probably know for sure. So check this out. This is one of the beauties of the C500 Mark II. The way it's shaped and everything, it fits onto these gimbals, no problem. Only downside is this cable that it comes with is a little bit short. So if I kind of straighten it out, you can see it kind of tugs. The cable it comes with, I think is like 20 inches. So it's definitely worth getting the longer one. I think there's one for like 30 something inches, which would be perfect for something like this, but it's also like 349 bucks. So something to keep in mind, definitely if you do a lot of gimbal work, definitely worth having that extra cable. But with this monitor set up like this, it's awesome because I literally just tap the screen to where I want it to focus. I mean, these higher end gimbal setups, usually a two, three, four person operation. But this one I could pretty comfortably do it myself and it's pretty lightweight relatively at least. So I'm gonna take this, hop on this one wheel real quick and let's see what kind of shots we can get. These are literally some of the easiest shots I've gotten out of this Moby Pro. Usually the Moby... Of course. I also love how easy it is to swap between different ND filters. I don't have to drop anything into a map box. I don't have to thread anything on. I literally just push a button and it gives me two stops, four stops, or six stops. And then you could also extend it out so it layers a couple of the ND filters. So then you could also get eight stops and 10 stops. And that pretty much covers you for a majority of what you need. So the convenience is all there. This is a very convenient camera to use. It's very pleasant. This monitor is also nice and bright even when we're getting hit by direct sunlight it's still very visible i can see my composition and my shots and color is okay so love that another convenient button is the s and f so i can press it and it automatically puts me into different frame rates so i usually have it set to 60 so if i'm shooting 24 frames per second quickly need to get a slow-mo shot i just press that it puts me in that mode very convenient but you do lose autofocus when you're in that mode so if i want to shoot 4k 60 I'm gonna lose that autofocus, which is unfortunate because the camera itself is capable of doing it. Because instead of pressing the S and F button, if you just set the camera's frame rate to 60 frames per second, then you maintain your audio as well as your dual pixel autofocus. So firmware update, I would love to see is still having dual pixel autofocus even when I press the S and F button. And also another thing I would love to see in some of these is better high frame rate options. I mean, we can get up to 120 frames per second on this, but only in super 16 crop mode which is a pretty significant crop you can still get pretty clean 120p slow-mo out of it but i would just love to see 120p in like the full frame mode now the way the monitor is mounted you might be familiar with it if you've ever shot on the c200 and originally i was like uh i don't totally get it it's kind of floppy and weird but now that i've actually gotten a lot of time behind it i actually love it because of how versatile it is you can kind of press it up against your shoulder use it like this i've had it like this for a while it's kind of like my vlogging monitor and if you're a red shooter you'll probably like to do something like this but many different ways to hold it comfortably so i like that and the weight of it like i said is kind of just right there where it's not heavy so in that way i really appreciate that it's plastic and i imagine it's hard plastic i mean sixteen thousand dollars i imagine they'd probably use pretty good plastic <laughs> another new thing about the c500 mark to so that is going to be modular you can see there's a slot for plate back here a viewfinder can slip on right here i love that the viewfinder is removable i never really used it that much on the c300 mark ii and it would always get in the way of gimbals i kind of made a whole video explaining the layout of all the buttons where everything kind of is located so i'll link to that right there but the more i use it the more i love it i mean like you got your main access buttons right here if you're kind of shoulder rigging it or if you got it on a tripod or you're not using this you can access those same buttons here and then if you're using the grip you also have your joystick and your main control buttons here joystick's actually pretty cool if you're using autofocus with face detect because you have a couple different faces on there then all you have to do is literally hop between faces using the joystick so that's been pretty neat now one of the things to keep in mind is that this camera does drain 
the battery much, much faster than something like a C300 Mark II. For example, this big old battery might have lasted you, what, like four hours on a C300 Mark II or C200 or whatever. On here, it's under two hours. I think it gave me an estimate of about 110 minutes. So in Thailand, I definitely found myself trying to shut off the camera as much as possible. Luckily, the boot up time is pretty good. So I'm gonna fire her up in three, two, one, and let's see how long it takes before she boots up. Hear the fan, boom, and I can already record right there. So that's pretty good for a cinema camera, right? Now you might have noticed that I did attach this back unit to it. So this is one of the extensions. You've got now a V mount, battery mount, and two more XLR ports. So this is input three, input four. So we're talking about four XLR inputs with phantom power. So that's actually awesome. I always felt that with my previous cameras, having two XLR inputs were just barely too little. Because if I'm filming three people, I at least want one boom mic and a loft per person. So that's three channels. So having four mic inputs, love that. You got a D-tap with 50 watt max. You got your gen lock sync right here. And you still get your time code right here on the main body. So even if you don't have this, you still have time code. And then we got remote B, ethernet and lens control. But just being able to slap on this V-mount is nice because now you got a camera that can run for much, much longer. If you don't mind the extended size and weight of this thing, it's probably the way to go. Although this doesn't really add that much weight. It's pretty lightweight plastic. It's just the size. Look at this thing. This looks nothing like what we were carrying around time. Thailand, right? That's part of the beauty of this camera, right? Is kind of the modularity of it. I probably wouldn't mind one or two extra D-taps out of this backpack unit, but I got one D-tap out of this V-mount battery, so that gives me two. So that's probably gonna be running one to wireless focus and also wireless video feed. Of course, you got 50 watts out of here, so you can split this no problem and send one to another external monitor and all that. Now, a few more things. Check this out. Zoom into there, generate, oh, there it goes. I am officially now 31 years old. I know a lot of people are like, what, you're 31? You seem so immature for your age. <laughs> but yeah, it's my birthday now, January 24th is the day. Thanks for celebrating that with me. But anyways, all the shots you've seen so far have just been shot on that 10-bit codec that's on here. It's a very easy file to work with. I love using it. Here's a few shots in the 5.9K RAW and I'll punch in a little bit so you can kind of see how much detail you can actually get out of this camera at its maximum performance. It's great. It's powerful, it's raw, 5.9K, it's amazing, but it's a little bit overkill for most of the work I do. So yeah, I've been happy with that 10-bit codec. That codec is called XFAVC, it's a 422 10-bit codec, very powerful. I mean, it goes up to 810 megabits per second max. So really impressive stuff, even if you're not trying to get into that raw codec life. Also, the CF Express memory cards, love the speed on these. I downloaded 50 gigabytes of data just just now and it took me like 40 seconds to download it. It literally, zoop, it was awesome. Now we got an EF mount on here, but we can also switch it out for a PL mount for some of the higher end cinema lenses, but there are no options for the RF mount, Canon's new lens system. And I'm imagining it's because the flange distance was too short and they needed to fit these ND filters back here. So that's my guess on why they didn't include that. That's a bummer. I mean, I'm using the RF lens right now, but you know, there's plenty of EF lenses and PL lenses that are great out there. But overall, I'd say it's it's a perfect kind of middle ground camera to where you're gonna be able to get definitely professional results. It's a step up from the image quality you'll get out of, you know, DSLR, mirrorless world. I still wouldn't say the image quality is as good as, you know, something like an Arri Alexa or anything like that. But at the same time, I'm not gonna do a massive hike into a remote village in Thailand while carrying this thing around. This is the one for that job. Anyways, let's wrap this up by reading a few comments. April says, how did I just lose two hours watching some guy I just found a calls himself potato. No regrets though. That's, that's, yeah, uh, that's really weird, isn't it? I'm 31 years old. I should probably stop calling myself potato. I can't wait till I'm 50 years old and still going like, hey guys, it's potato jet. Like, <laughs> what? Oh, and by the way, I've also been putting a little bit more effort into my vlog channel. I think I kind of know what I want to do with it. So you should totally go check it out and subscribe to, you know, the new vlog channel. And uh, yeah, it's my birthday. So you kind of have to do everything I say or else you're a terrible person. That is a fact. Anyways. I'm gonna end this video here. Goodbye, I'm gonna go to sleep. Actually, I can't go to sleep because I'm jet lagged. I'm still in Thailand time. It's like, well, 12, 18, I'm super wide awake.